people are still going to be straggling in here. Um, this event today is one in a series of literary events we have this month at the Jerusalem Fund. Um, our speaker today, actually, as you know if you've read the literature, um, is an award-winning playwright. You probably have heard of him before. You may be familiar. Maybe you've even seen the performance of the play, Tennis and Nablus. He's also known for other plays such as um, Truth Serum Blues and more recently Sabra Falling. He was also recently an artist, uh, I'm sorry, a writer in residence at the Mizna organization. And I believe he just get, got back from Beirut where he was doing some uh, work towards adaptations of some literature, adaptations to uh, theater. So he's a very active young uh, talent in theater and apparently also a poet. And so his work today that he's going to share with you are recent uh, poems called uh, The Insurgency, Poetic Dispatches from the Terror Wars 2003 to 2013. It's a very poetic title in itself. And as you can tell even just from the titles of his plays and poems and work, he's a very outspoken and uh, articulate uh, person. So we really look forward to his contributions today. And I'd just like to say one word to our uh, online audience. You're very welcome to tweet in your questions during the question answer session. And if we see anything that's you know, relevant to the discussion, then we will pass it on to him and he can um, answer it. So thank you all very much. And please give Ismail Khaladi a very warm welcome. Hello. Uh, you guys can hear me, right? Small room. Um, thank you for that introduction. Thank you guys all for coming um, in the middle of the day. Um, it's a real honor to be here at the Jerusalem Fund in the Palestine Center. Um, I've long admired the, the programming and the work that's done here um, by Yusuf and all the wonderful staff um, here. So it is an honor. I'd just like to apologize ahead of time my voice is a little off and I'm a little out of it. I just returned um, from Lebanon and Egypt uh, 36 hours ago. So uh, I'm kind of recovering. But uh, I'm really ecstatic to be here with you guys. Um, so just a quick preface. Um, these, uh, I'm going to read a handful of poems from a collection called The Insurgent Sea. Um, and I'm obviously not going to read the whole collection. I'll just share about a dozen poems. Um, but these were written over about a 10-year period from 2003 to 2013, um, so basically my 20s. Um, and they obviously cover a decade, about that first decade of the 21st century uh, in which we saw the advent of the War on Terror, which I call the Terror Wars. Um, and so kind of threaded throughout this work, you'll hear a lot about Iraq and um, all of the kind of uh, accompanying horrific violence that, um, that stemmed from those wars that still go on today. Um, and in all of its manifestations and its theaters, et cetera. And I also kind of in exploring and reacting uh, over those 10 years as a, as a poet, as a Palestinian-American poet, um, I found myself also going back and forth in history and found that exploring my own kind of family history was uh, very helpful in understanding the current events and the current moments and vice versa. Um, so all that is to say, um, this is, I hope, a very fluid collection that jumps around a bit, but hopefully you'll be able to kind of see the thematic <coughs> kind of thread that, that goes throughout. So I'll just jump in. And then uh, hopefully we'll have like about 20 minutes afterwards where we can just talk and informally and have a discussion. Raven talk. Listen. Listen before I speak. Listen, because I gots to. Because that's how you learn to talk. Listen to paper before the pen drops. Listen to silence. Listen to masked men in sad static babble before the sword drops. Listen to the shock 
and awe of it, then crop your ear to the wind like Vincent to listen, I tell you. Listen to raven talk, listen to passers-by as they walk, listen to salt-stained concrete talk. Here out, burnt out, stained by sea salt, refugee cheeks that talk of a flooding fit to burst the floors of my brain. Roll off the tongue, speak. Roll out of bed, speak. Listen to dead, speak. I hear Merkava beast battle tabla beats on narrow Nakba streets. Hear it limp and stomp over rubble of apartments and crops that crisscross my stomach. Gut check. Here, rooftop Molotov slung, street rocks slung into armor talk. Hear the lap of slave ships in triangular holocaust. Heard second equilateral added in yellow, too. Hear the clank and spew of metal, chains and pipe that seep, pipes that seep death. Hear all those who got caught. Catch sounds, catch fright, catch breath, and listen. Because how could you not? Why you look like that. The reflection speaks without speaking. You, it says, are from a place filled with a hundred places. Eyes, an island somewhere between Sparta and Troy, washed up in the wake of some battle to the death. Rough crusader blade entering lands it should not, an act of theft. And Turkic weaver of things, too, escaping Mongol hordes that descend from steppes. Nose, the profile fits, rugged Sabaean highlands via Bedouin believers bringing Byzantium to its knees. An Ottoman Jewess of the Black Sea, seeker of home, arrived off the winds of fateful visions of return. Rassanid kings of Mount Hermon, blended with Phoenician merchants destined to dock in Brooklyn and Brazil, the Andes and elsewhere. Mouth, the product of long-ago deliveries, full silk road crates of cloth and spice, slaves and stories carried by caravan, lips that knew moon and sun and wind better than home. Skin, a crisp valley in the Caucasus, Master horseman of Circassian slave stock into Mamluk, manager of empire. Or perhaps a Berber sword for hire, fleeing the front lines once Andalus fell forever. And on and on, through millennia of mestizo miscegenation, equations of Levantine lasciviousness and invasion upon invasion. You are Canaanite, Jebusite, Hebrew, and Philistine from Crete, Egyptian, Lydian, and Anatolian, Greek, Roman, Persian, Arab, Turk, and every era. A new touch, a new tyrant, a riot, and the inevitable revolt, the recurring trait, a face filled with a hundred places. Uh, routine procedures burning and the quote I have above this is from General Tommy Franks March 2003rd we don't do body counts in Arabic we say books are written in Cairo published in Beirut and read in Baghdad mama reminded me of this and pops repeated it but only to correct the order of it which I butchered and I don't remember where or when I first heard it perhaps over a pot of okra or as we watched the Iraqi capital fall into that green-lit hell, the winter of my eighth birthday. Mama cooked, and we dreamed of returning. We dreamed of returning to where books were published, not pawned for food, written and read and recited, rather than hidden from your fires and looting. Besides the dining room, the walls of our house were made of books. Routine procedures, holy. Quran clashes with jazz ballads at a quarter to three. Azan mingles with Mingus, Brother B, and me, quintessential quartet with more minds. Ramadan comes alive this year with the dead of imperial bombing. 
In crescent sliver of high noon rerun western, Baghdad shivers, throbbing under six-shooter and spurred boot, ask myself what fast months, days, and nights might bring for Mosul, Gaza, Fallujah. Hunger strikes with gringo artillery and gunships, just as confession drips off the brow through the hood, and here we are, covered in blood to prove it. So this kind of enters into an Iraqi series of poems. Insurgency. Ya Zalami, we can fight in sandals, in the sand, storm the hot sun on cool nights, house to house combat on rooftops and in galabiyas and kafiyas, fatigues or just plain tired, hungry in morning or dead of nights. Ramadan's fast or slow, we many we fight these crusades of yours, not ours, brought to these two rivers, these marshes, hills, and dust-swept badlands near Baghdad. This place, this place has fallen before, stumbled into the barbed wire embrace, the flames of violators occupied by illiterates before, but never really fallen. So I bet my life, this city is still standing, watching when your backs can be seen leaving here with a kind of Saigon on your mind, back west, back down to wherever it is you came from. The Butcher of Baghdad is captured, 2006. This man, once mustached, now bearded, once in fatigues and beret, all swagger, now staggering, fatigued and cloaked in the camera's gaze, will hang. He will twist, dangle, curdle, and gasp, and then he will shrivel on history's stage, drying under the blaze of Babylonian suns, Mesopotamian sands, and the wind will not give a damn that this man should suffer such a fate. The same gusts that blew his poison across the land will beat his face that day, slap it with bits of desert, the smells of two rivers flooded, with sewage and rotten dates, bloodied bodies and the salt of a million tears. Many will smile that day, and many will die too. But justice will be done when the bad man expelled from his palaces and then his whole hangs like the deposed lords of the Middle Ages like witches and wretched Jews, devilish Muslims and godless Indios of the Inquisition. And his evil will die with him, we are told. But when he begins to turn on that creaky scaffold in the broken, shattered country he, rule, he once ruled by the dim, blinding light of fear, will we see the faces of his enablers, too, see them with their pasty masks, the smiles, the handshakes and shipments, the blistering weaponry, the money spent to support his past discretions, or will we forget now that he is no longer under our protection? Will we smell the villainy of these times on the day the bad man of Baghdad dies? So since we're in DC, um, I'm gonna share a short series, um, or rather a series of short poems called um, Cabinet Contents. And there's about 25 of them. I'll read maybe six. Um, so I'll just jump around. The numbers won't be in order. No. Cabinet Contents number three, Condoleezza. Front page. The woman from Washington has come, arrived today, just for the day, specially deployed on the run to talk of peace and lecture on freedom. Backstage, the local women and children have already been told the news. Take cover or run. The woman with bombs in her tongue has come. Cabinet contents number 15. Kerry. Mr. Kerry looks older now, that he is beating war drums instead of tossing away war medals. 
Cabinet Contents Number 13, Hegel. Chuck once shared some basic truths, inconvenient in fact, but had to take them back, again and again on his knees, and now he is Secretary of Defense, reluctant but ready to please, ready to tomahawk some Arabs and coolies and other subhuman savages halfway across the world. Cabinet Contents Number 18, Dennis and Martin. The men who sabotaged peace since Madrid and Oslo are still in place, shuffled back into the deck for one last chance to beat the dead horse until it's doubly dead. All the while droning on about two states and tough breaks and getting back to tables to negotiate in good faith, they are interviewed and listened to as if they weren't covered in the dust of decades of demolition and a thousand and one half-truths and they wonder why we sing the blues. Cabinet contents number 23, Sam and Sue. The humanitarian interventionists are now empowered on their podiums. They are empowered on their podiums to tell us who deserves fire for their sins. Cabinet contents number two, Madeline. The owl swoops into the studio. Miss Ambassador, the reporter asks. It is said that multiple Hiroshima's worth of kids have died from sanctions. Is it worth the price? She zeroes in on that thought of her prey and nods with hunter's eyes. Yes, she hoots. The price is worth it. And yet the Hague will never house this raptor or her bosses. Only third-rate tin pot warlords from the global south and the eastern bloc get sent to that dock. <clears throat> and now a little bit to Palestine. An incomplete ode. We sing and dance, we dance and sing from balconies overlooking catastrophe upon catastrophe. We spit rhymes, wickedly funny, sharp, stinging resistance poetry shaped from sad saliva dreams. We carve olive's wood into figurines, if only to mimic what has been stolen from underneath our feet. We shout, watching the news, obscene repeats, reports that twist and turn around the truth. We kiss under sonic booms that burn lips full of whispered promises of return. We push products over convenient counters to send cash to cousins strapped behind walls of concrete and trash stitched into patchwork destitution. We embroider pillows and dresses, bags and pouches, stories and myths. We spot each other anywhere. In the Falastini, on streets from Amsterdam to New York, Santiago to Milan, Chicago to Amman, spot each other with built-in radars of happenstance that blink with any hint from posture to pronunciation, a silent dance. We erupt in Tedebke to the beat of a peasant's drum, no matter how far the dance floor is from the hum of harvest lore. We step and we run from tear gas and we hustle around corners to work and to class. We sprint downfield to meet the perfect pass, to shoot on goal. Netted, we shoot back. Fire manifestos and homemade protest into the air to mix with prayers and the hellish glow of flares. We light up the sky with smoke usually Marlboro Reds. In abundance, find ways to laugh at our predicament, our misery, our brilliance. We raise young with stories of paradise and pain, planted in ears by elders who hold keys and yellowed papers to prove we once existed. We exist. And we return, if our papers let us, we return to look upon a land deformed by an invader's spade. And we leave, if our papers let us, and both ways we wait at checkpoints at borders for answers a way in over bridges and terminals baking under sun and the heat of interrogation we cook masakhan and fette mlukhiye and hashwi mtabbal hummus mahshi and ma'lube fluently we drink tea minted and bombed with sugar thick we march towards walls and attack with graffiti messages for anyone out there 
who gives a shit. We speak in politics, in Arabic, Hebrew, French, Spanish, English, and immigrant, patois, prophets in motion. We write, we sing, we dance, we walk in the dark canyons of hundred cities from balconies overlooking catastrophe upon catastrophe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And this one is kind of in conversation with that last piece. Um, and it's an incomplete lament. I see that place, but usually from afar. And I have visited, known it in my nostrils and heels and fingertips, have followed its every move from over here. But mostly I only dream of walking its stone terraces, of breathing its summer stars the long way back from barbecues held in gardens between houses built of arches, underneath crossed laundry lines and satellite wires that let the world in through a hundred, a thousand kinds of siege. I dream of growing my tangled tongue back, the one lost in an airport terminal or in a dark crevice between impossible economy seats of the 80s and 90s. Years when English conquered and occupied my thoughts, man mandated fealty to its syntax, until it was too late to split my talk in two, like the Tigris and Euphrates. And still, I imagine conversations and wit and politics argued in Arabic over cigarettes and coffee in, and demarrowed lamb bones drying on empty plates beneath some airy fig tree born in stone. I want to learn the alleyways. In each of its cities and towns, shift dialects accordingly and know the wadis and trees, the wild flowers and the names and faces of farmers' kids by heart, the things one must know when one is home. And I remember friends that never were. Imagine this poem written from right to left, left to right from written in my own sloppy hand. I see an old city where light can still enter through the narrow darkness as it used to, a city where faces aren't hammered into a thousand shades of defeat. And then I remember their borders, their questions, their airport, their stairs, their walls, their invasions and evasions, their strip searches and strip malls, their security, and their security, and their security, and the endless destruction, and then construction. Everywhere you look, the horizon transformed in their image. And I am reminded that I do not want to go back anymore, do not want to enter such a vision imposed over the terrain of a perfectly good dream. And, um, and I'm going to read a couple from a series um, called Beirut Fragments. And I was born in Beirut in, in 1982. Um, and um, my sisters were born uh, during the Civil War and, and, uh, and grew up uh, for their first years through the invasion in 82. And we left in 83. Um, so Beirut Fragments, number one. The walk to work became more absurd as the 70s progressed. By 76, the massacres oh. began. By 79, Mahmoud was married, barely 30, with a gig, two baby daughters, and a Russian-made pistol tucked in his leather briefcase. But the gravity of the whole affair was undeniable. Classes would be canceled. War was in session. Rune ran to work through the rain of bullets with boy in belly. Sorry, I'm late. It would be a C-section, by the way. Selwa, 77, shot in the leg, driving to hospital to see first-born baby granddaughter Lemia. Lulu and Yasser played happily in backyards with turtles and every afternoon hair brushed and braided by grandma. Didi celebrated birthday number three to the soundtrack of sonic boom diving fighter planes and explosions of an alien invasion, fireworks for Dima. 
Mahmoud shot up the ceiling with Kalashnikov one night while standing guard against the uncivil thieves of war safety, was apparently not on when he checked the chamber, sleepily pulled the trigger, woke the neighbors, greeted family with a head full of plaster, blushing. Idris stood guard on the balcony and mostly shot rats, fat off the refuse of war. Selwa, 83, widowed with one son of three now gone, drives down Corniche to seafront through checkpoints behind the front line telling soldiers it is an emergency but once out of sight unloads throws the guns from their hiding place under the back seat into the bottom of the sea you see the Israelis are everywhere hunting don't breathe Beirut fragments number five a spring downpour of bullets tears apart the poet's mouth, departs out the back of his skull, past sleepy eyes of his son who wants to know why Baba's not speaking or writing or breathing no more. His typewriter falls silent too, covered in the contents, contents of his recently released brain. But Beirut is beautiful that day. Somehow it did not rain. And actually, I'm going very fast here. This is my last piece. I thought I would kind of dawdle along more, so um, we'll have plenty of time to talk. Um, this is um, called a Diasporic Semitic Solidarity Love Letter slash poem. Let us go back. Let me taste those words spoken into that place that needs a hand from another branch of the Semite tree. It is the 21st century and we are all burning. So let us share water like we used to, you say, in Andalus, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Palestine. Let us share that water we are all burning. So I met you. And this wall has been here since our Nekbas brought us together. Shadows of each other now painted into a state of being, concrete mo megaliths suffocating the unseen. And here is Abdul Halim, wailing deep to tell them the truth. So tell me, did we know each other in Granada, or en route as you fled Fez and I back to Damascus? Or perhaps it was down them salty paths to Nablus? Where'd I peep you last before Minneapolis? Because I'm sure we have a past to us. Maybe Brooklyn, or Chicago, or was it Warsaw? Rising ghetto as you flung brick through glass, and I prepared explosive blasts, massed in market-bound baskets, our only chance to survive them flagrant Germanic fascists. Help me remember to release these stones, these slung-shot words so our speech can mourn facts on the ground. Sewn from the string of homes and groves, rezoned and bulldozed to make way for those he is said to have chose. And I swear, I was by your side always. If you ask, we were hand in hand when ye yellow bands were stitched to our sides, and I was with you as Torquemada hissed his way into Orify in order to Christianize. And I saw you fleeing Haifa too, and Yaffa, telling the young not to cry gripping that key, the only map, back to that place, this poem, and I cannot read it or write it, cannot free it without you, and us is all we need to wear away these walls. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So yeah, as I said, that was, quicker than I expected. Um, so yes, that's that's a very kind of small handful from, from this collection, which is a book length collection of poetry. Um, and I guess I'm happy to just kind of open it up. Hi, sorry, I'm sorry. My name is Khiri El Hariri. I am from Beirut, Lebanon. I was born in Beirut, Lebanon, like you all mm. you were. And uh, I was really very satisfied. Some of you have uh, re uh, told us about Beirut and Palestine and all this. My husband is Palestinian, my children are Palestinian mm. too. And I am very proud of you all. 
uh, my question is for you. Did you say, did you s since you are, you, were, you are Arab and uh, you were born in Beirut, Lebanon, as a Palestinian, did you put something in Arabic? Did you put something in Arabic? Did I write something in Arabic? Yeah. My Arabic is very poor, you know. Uh, how I, I mean, I, I speak immigrant you Arabic. When you were I was less than a year, less than a year old. Oh, that's, yeah. the, that's the reason yeah. why. Yeah, okay. yeah. I understand. I, but, you know, uh, one, uh, next time I come, I'll have something in Arabic for you. It's hard for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll just rehearse yeah. it a cup for a couple hours. But I'll be fine. Uh, yeah. We were very touched. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um. Hi. Uh, I'm Phil Schrafer. I'm just a, a neighbor here. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, two, just two comments uh, and a question. Uh, first comment is, um, it's interesting that Saddam Hussein was portrayed as such an evil man given that Rumsfeld used to visit him on a regular basis and we provided him with helicopters, right. uh, anthrax uh, cultures and other various uh, use, useful elements for warfare. Uh, the, the second thing, it's also Condoleezza Rice who said we had no idea that they would use airplanes as bombs. Totally absurd. Anyway, mm -hmm. question, do you have to do things with, with Jewish poets or? Uh mm -hmm. Do I have to or do I choose to? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, sure. I'll, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, the, the poem, the last one, uh, was written as a piece with a, a Jewish poet in Minneapolis, a friend of mine of uh, Moroccan descent many years ago, and this was kind of my half of it. So really, it's an incomplete poem that I read. Um, and I've, yes, I mean, I've, I've worked with a lot, Kevin Koval, who's a um, great poet out of Chicago. I've done some stuff with him. But yeah, I mean, I don't really think about it. If it's good poetry and it's good politics, I don't really care who the person is. <coughs> want to commend you on your beautiful poetry. Thank it just you. really reached out and grabbed me <laughs> as a Palestinian. Um, do you have them compiled into a book that we can purchase today? No, unfortunately. Um, so I just finished this com this collection, and um, I'm kind of looking for a publisher right now. So h next time I come, I'll have books to sell. Okay. Thank Inshallah. you. Inshallah. And the first thing I said when I first saw you was your likeness to your father. I listened to him several times and we own s a couple of his books, the Iron Cage, one of them. Nice. So Thank you. Commend you. I've had a lot of plastic surgery to get that. <laughs> um, y I'll just say something really quick, which is, oh, sorry, go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Okay, so while you're getting the microphone, I just kind of been thinking back and, and like, you know, man, this is like a depressing lot of poems. So I'm sorry for kind of being a downer in the middle of your day. Um, <laughs> but anyway. Thank you so much uh, to the center and to you for such <coughs> a, a wonderful uh, presentation of the truth in a very moving way, an efficient way. Uh, my name is Oscar and uh, I am a... Uh, Arts and humanities specialist, and also international relations. If I make a comment, if I may make a comment, you sure. know, I think that you exemplify the strength of the Palestinian people because you uh, are um, a Palestinian. Mm. I can feel it. Mm. You know, I w I know you were born in in Beirut, and I know you grew up and live in the United States, and that makes it even more interesting because you remind us, for instance, about Iraq. Mm. And in, in a poetic way, such a horrible chapter in the U.S. history, a chapter which was implemented with the sole purpose to bring the uh, globalizing neoliberalism and economics to Iraq and to mm. privatize everything except the oil industry because with that, the Iraqs can pay back the United States for the invasion. Mm -hmm. And also, I think that it is very important the fact that you show how universal is the Palestinian struggle. Mm. And it's getting more and more universal. You mentioned, for instance, uh, words which are very precise in Spanish, like mestizo, mm. me especially from Latin America, and gringo. And also you mentioned Santiago, 
which show the universality of the Palestinian struggle. Mm. And uh, my question would be the following. Uh, in your experience, uh, where do you receive, uh, in the t thinking of the world, you know, the most expressions of support for the Palestinian struggle? Hmm. First question. Second, could you mention something about your one play? What is it about? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Thanks so yeah, much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, my, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll expose my one of my things, which is that my partner is, is from she's from Chile. So that's so that's how I pronounce those words uh, uh, kind of <laughs> decently. Um, um, yeah, I mean, you're uh, thank you for what you said. Um, I mean, I'm not the person to say where the kind of most solidarity comes from. I think it comes from diff in different forms, from different places, um, at different times. You know, I mean, I think that there's a certain solidarity that, I you know, Irish folks have with Palestine that's different, but s also similar to Indians uh, from the subcontinent. And um, there's a certain solidarity in Latin America that's different from that. I mean. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it, it depends uh, on, on where. Um, but I mean, for me, the issue of solidarity is very important. And I feel that, um, you know, one thing that w I think, you know, Palestinians need to do, keep doing and do more of is reaching out to other people's struggles. And not, and even though, you know, the Palestinian struggle is a very kind of tough one um, and the odds are very much stacked against us. I think it's it's you know incumbent upon us to also realize other people's struggles and kind of reach out in order for them to more easily reach back to us. And um, and I think sometimes we've done that well as a people and as individuals, and sometimes not so much. But to me, it's certainly very important. It, um, it was the way I was raised, you know, as a secular kind of Palestinian. Um, you know, my plays. Are, um, my first play, Truth Serum Blues, was a one-person show in which I acted, um, which was produced at Pangaea World Theater in Minneapolis. I don't act so much anymore, um, but uh, that was kind of more of a p of um, I had a lot of spoken word. A lot of it was a very kind of poetic multimedia thing, and my my later plays have been kind of more traditional um, plays with many characters. Um, I wrote a play, a play called Tennis and Nablus, which was produced um, in Atlanta and upstate New York about the 1936 uh, Arab revolt against the British in Palestine. Um, so I'm, I'm, the his, I'm the son of a historian. So for me, hi history is, is kind of this amazing landscape to be mined for drama and for many of humor and tragedy, but also, you know, very kind of... Um, instructive for the present moment I think as well and um, for example you know nobody in this country knows about Palestine about sorry the rebellion against the British in in the 30s and you know we kind of talk about uh, you know the Indian struggle for independence against the British and that's a great thing and the Irish struggle against the British and that's a great thing but Palestine is not put in that same context, and it should, because one, it proves that we existed as a people and were vying for our independence and liberation and self-determination before the creation of the State of Israel against a colonial power. Um, so it, to me, that's a very, very important moment in history. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just wrote a, a play about Sabra and Shatila, um, and um, yeah, I mean, I tend to write about the Middle East and Palestine specifically. Hi, Penny Mitchell. Thank you. Um, could you talk just a little bit about... Hi, Penny. I know you. I know. <laughs> uh, how are you? Good to see you. Um, could you talk a little bit about the beat of your poetry, mm -hmm. about the sort of the music of it, the sound mm -hmm. of it? The, I mean, the sound <coughs> both in, in beat and meter and in, you know, sort of explosion of words and stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you could talk about it both sort of from an internal and an external point mm -hmm. of view, like where it's coming from in you and mm -hmm. what you think it represents and also sort of looking at it from outside. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, my, I kind of started performing and writing uh, spoken word many, 
over 10 years ago. Um, so that that's kind of, there's still a little bit of that in some of my work in that that's a very rhythmic performative kind of poetry. Um, you know, I mean, I think, I don't know, I can't say like where it comes from. I mean, I'm, I, I love hip hop. I love, um, you know, um, so that, I think that's part of it. Um, I think it also, you know, the kind of, I would like to think it's there's some of the kind of meter of Arabic poetry that finds a way into my English as well, but I can't say that for sure. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that, um, I, th you know, I think hip hop as a, as a kind of musical form that is very much, a, I think in its essence about resistance and about, um, dissent, um, is, lends itself to talking about Palestine. At least I find it does. So I think it, it, it's very, I mean, I think it's influenced me in some ways. Although I don't consider myself like a hip hopper at all, just to be clear, I'm not. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, tell me. I mean, well, I, I actually even actually even heard a little bit of Debke in your music, mm. uh, and it is very musical. And there's, I also get the feeling of um, bombs. Y you know, there's an e there's an explosion of words. Um, I mean, I think there's just a lot. You can blur but the book when it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> you can put that on the back. Actually, I, I want to echo what uh, the, all the positive things that people have been saying. You're, you're, you give, you give such a complicated and these interconnected, complicated histories, such beautiful expression, and I really congratulate you on Thank that. You. Um, and actually, kind of following on what Penny was saying, I think your hearing your poetry is really a treat. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we, it, it, I'm curious about that translation between the, the oral the and the visual. And yeah. yeah, and if maybe you could speak to that. And I'd like to also <coughs> just encourage you to maybe record mm -hmm. your poetry in some way so that people <coughs> could hear it. I'm being done here. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah. I mean, that's. I think that's one of the challenges of 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 being a poet who, you know, uh, does have a kind of interest in playing with rhythm and and meter, um, and the kind of performativity and the kind of rhythmic performativity of poetry, and then also kind of how does that translate on the page? And so, um, you know, I I tend to kind of like try to spend a lot of time thinking about how it works on the page. Um, so that it's not just something that can be read out loud, that it still has an impact on the page when you're reading it alone, you know. Um, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully it works both ways. We have 10 more minutes. I'm gonna fill the space here. Good. Is it on? Okay. Um, well, I just wanted to say yes, <coughs> Thank you so much for your reading today. Mm -hmm. It's very powerful work, and you really, uh, what's amazing about you is that you're a young voice in what seems almost like a void. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that to denigrate the work of predecessors at all, but at this moment it seems like there's a void in the cultural sector mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Although uh, that's also probably not being fair to m m more mainstream cultures in the Middle East and so on. Mohammed Asaf mm -hmm. is a great mm -hmm. young talent mm -hmm. also. But what I mean is that you're speaking about political history and you're speaking about personal experience and you're fusing it together in a way that's also very particular to the cultures that you come from, the hi hybrid or mixed cultures. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just want to commend your work. Mm -hmm. I think it's very, very powerful and I want to encourage you also. And even though you describe what you did today as being kind of a downer, it's actually very refreshing to mm -hmm. hear these truths spoken in this medium, mm -hmm. you know, and it would be nice if this were more commonplace. Yeah, so that's thank, all. You. thank you. Thank you. I'm sort of on the other side of that coin and would like to hear about the vibrance of 
um, your group of young writers and musicians and poets and painters uh, mm -hmm. in the Arab world and um, Arab yeah. Americans. If you could just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I, you know, I, I'm not going to give like specific examples per se, but I mean, I think that, I mean, I think that what Samia said is right. I mean, I think there there has been a, a void in some ways, a generational one, but I think that it is changing. And I think that also we're seeing a lot of stuff in the diaspora now because you know we're we're getting kind of a couple generations down the line and um the kind of the hybridity has kind of settled i think more and more and the kind of education and the experience has also settled uh with kind of palestinians in the diaspora of, of my generation and so i think that's producing a lot of interesting work in in, in the arts um but yeah i mean i think that listen i mean i think that there's so much happening in Palestine that we just don't, it's so hard to kind of get a grasp of from here or even from there because it's so hard to get from point A to point B, you know. Um, but I think that there's um, the, the kind of resilience and the steadfastness and the creativity of the Palestinian people in Palestine and in the camps is astounding and kind of breathtaking. Um, so I think it's there. I think it's up to us to kind of, who are have the kind of privilege of being in the West or wherever. Um, well, it depends how you look at it, whether it's a privilege or not. But certainly we are, pr I'm privileged. We are privileged in many ways. Um, it's, I think it's up to us to kind of give, um, you know, create platforms and support Palestinian artists there and in the diaspora as well. Um, because it's very hard if you're talking about Palestine to have a venue in the mainstream, you know. Uh, I mean, certainly in this country, um, and you know, in the Arab world, there's obviously different kind of channels, but um, but it's very, very hard to kind of write plays about Palestine or make music about Palestine or write poetry about Palestine that's that's actually political and somehow dangerous to the kind of status quo. Um, so it's it's really up to us and people in this room to support, you know, to f seek out and support those artists, I think, because they're there and they're creating amazing stuff. Um, but it's hard for them to be heard sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, I, I see uh, a change brought on by the internet and the mm -hmm. access to, and I know that access is certainly limited and privileged, um, but it has, it does seem to have been, become a platform for a lot of voices to be heard that would have been shut out of theaters or publishing houses or yeah. kind of other venues. And I wonder if that's, if you draw inspiration from that as well. Yeah, I'm pretty like technologically backward for my age. So I'm like not, I'm not really the, like I can do Gmail, you know? Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, but um, I mean, yeah, I think I think that goes both ways. I mean, I think that it it kind of gives these platforms and it empowers people, and it also kind of distracts people and and muddies the waters and waters it down and all that stuff. Um, but I think it's certainly, I mean, it's there's certainly some amazing th things that can come out online that otherwise we wouldn't have access to. So I mean I think that's one way of, of accessing what's going on in Palestine for example and um, or the rest of the Arab world and it's one way for the people to get their work out. But yeah I, I mean I'm not like a new, be new media expert so I can't talk too much about that. Just to follow up the thread here, um, I know what this lady was saying here is that you speak the lingo of this country. Mm. So for you to be Palestinian, speaking it to Americans as an American as well as Palestinian is much more impactful. Mm. Somebody ca can come from there and be just as eloquent, but mm. you know the culture, mm. you speak to the culture. Mm -hmm. There are other young people like Rachel Corey. Mm -hmm. I've seen the one person play mm -hmm. that was presented on her behalf and her words. Mm -hmm. But again, she's an outsider coming in you are an insider mm -hmm. from both cultures, and mm -hmm. I think it's very impactful. Yeah. And we do need more people like you mm -hmm. to speak out and reach the unreachable, if you will. Thanks. Oh, thank you.
thank you so much again. Now, uh, in the places where you have uh, presented your readings, what has been the reaction? Mm. Negative, positive? Uh <laughs> Well, actually, I think that's actually a good question because I think one of the kind of questions that all of this brings up is that is, you know, what's the line between kind of preaching to the converted and kind of the kind of sympathetic, you know, audiences and also finding a way to kind of challenge audiences that aren't naturally sympathetic. And I think that, you know, that's one of the dilemmas that we face kind of trying to talk about Palestine in this country is very often we fall into that category of kind of like finding ourselves either in these these audiences that are you know already get it and and are already supportive and that not to say that that's not useful and that's not healing and that's not um you know doesn't isn't conducive to growth and and networking and it's an inspiration but i think that and then on the other hand you know there are these audiences that are so overtly hostile that it's they're not listening you know, and I, f I think that one of the challenges for not just for artists and not just for p people like me, but in general, people talking about Palestine is to find a kind of the, the as big a cross section um, of an audience that has enough people who kind of are supportive and enough people who need to be convinced. But that, um, you know, we find a way to talk to people um, and who are not already convinced and have them listen to us. And that's really hard um, to find those audiences and, or to be given access to those audiences. I mean, generally, generally, I've had very good reactions. Like, I, I actually have had surprisingly li little interaction with people who just really don't want to listen and, and kind of want to, you know, kind of obstruct and undermine and interrupt the the discussion so i've i've been blessed in that in that but also you know i grew up in this country so i have i feel like i try as much as possible without losing the kind of edge and my principles and the kind of basic um core of what i'm trying to say i've also learned through experience you know some tricks uh, about talking to an american audience that kind of where you can kind of avoid some of the pitfalls and the red flags and the kind of, you know, traps, trap doors that we often fall into. Um, and I think that's different for everybody and it's different depending on the audience and depending on what, you know, you're, whether you're an artist or a politician or, a, you know, an academic or whatever. But, you know, I, and I, th but I think that increasingly, like I said before, as, you know, my generation and younger of Palestinians in the di diaspora kind of, get more educated and get more experienced and get more confident, you know, increasingly, like, it's only a matter of time before we kind of, the message gets across and more and more people, I think, are starting to kind of see that something is awry in Palestine and, and in U.S. policy. So I think it is changing s slowly. Yes, thank you very much. Very interesting. It's pretty much my comment in line with this interface of a cultural between, you know, these different worlds that uh, we live and we have the privilege of being one and talking about the other. I just uh, uh, would like uh, you, if you could expand a bit more on the area of uh, the influence of your family mm -hmm. in your work. Mm -hmm what kind of inspiration you mentioned history i know something about literature mm -hmm. in your family i just uh, wonder how it worked to drive yeah. your past to here yeah from the family perspective oh, that's an interesting question <laughs> um yeah i mean you know my um like i said i mean i come from a from a you know a now pretty secular palestinian family so i think that um you know that um kind of the 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 secular history of of the Palestinian struggle um was very much a part of my parents lives and and so I think I was influenced by that and I think that you know history obviously my mom used to be a librarian and a journalist and so I was always had books around me and I was always kind of encouraged to you know kind of engage with the arts without the kind of pressure of like having to be a doctor or like a lawyer or an engineer not that that I mean 
trust me, I wish I had kind of been a doctor sometimes. <laughs> Um, especially when I pay my credit card bills, but um, but yeah, I mean, so I, I I mean, I'm very blessed in kind of my immediate family to have been um, you know given those those choices and that that kind of uh, inspiration and, and encouragement. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know wh wh what else to really s s say about that. I mean. Um, I think also just like you know, I come from a family where three languages are where you know English, Arabic, and French are s are spoken kind of interchangeably, and so um, you know I think that kind of gives you um, a lot of, of freedom to engage with with more people and to kind of you know listen to more people and talk to more people. So in that sense, my fam my family is kind of uh, you know my, my f that's how my family has kind of inspired my work, but. Um, and I have a, just an amazing extended family as well, um, you know, and a lot of stories. I mean, I was just in Beirut, and you know, um, some of my um, my cousins of my father, um, who are his generation and, and older. Um, I mean, just the stories they have about um, about Palestine, about being Palestinian are just so there's it's such fodder um for for drama and for poetry and for like I said before for tragedy and 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 humor and I think that um you know that also is is um you know I I, I love sitting and listening to those stories I always have and I've, and and most of them find a way into my work you know most of um most of the things that kind of tie back to my family or or you know a lot of it is bits and pieces that I've kind of stitched together um, with some artistic license, but you know I find that those things are always kind of seeping into my work, and so I feel very kind of pr very lucky to have that reservoir of of stories and lore and experience to kind of draw draw upon. Um, yeah, and I think humor is a, is a huge thing. I mean, this wasn't particularly funny, but um, you know, I try in my plays to have uh, enough humor um, to kind of temper the inherent tragedy in the story, right? And I think that that's you know one thing that's amazing about Palestinians is that despite any everything and kind of regardless of the situations, there's always there you know there's this amazing sense of humor that finds its way through. And I've been in, with you know, groups of activists and everybody, um, you know, international act, American activists and the kind of, often the kind of Americans and the Westerners are kind of the most serious and dour and the kind of Palestinians are like the ones cracking jokes and laughing. Not that they're not serious activists, but they, you know, it's, it's ironic that, you know, <laughs> the people who are from Gaza or from Ramallah are the ones who kind of have the brightest sense of humor in those situations. And I think that says something about Palestinian steadfastness and humor as a as a tool to survive and to resist. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You just came back from Egypt, and if you were working with other Egyptian activists there. Mm -hmm. During this turbulence time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, my my gra my mother grew up in Egypt. Okay. Um, so, and my grandmother lived there. Um, so I've I've you know I go back to e I've gone back to Egypt many 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 times over my life. But I was uh, this time it was for family reasons. Um, I actually, my grandmother passed away away, and she was born in 1924 in Jaffa. Um, and spent most of her life in, in, in Egypt. Um, so I was there for that, and I was doing work in Beirut. Um, but yeah, I didn't have the pleasure, or, or I didn't have the opportunity, I should say, to meet with Egyptian activists. Um, but the situation there is not great, I would say, in my limited time there. But yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I'd like to have you. Absolutely. It would be my pleasure. Thank you. Thank